Hello everyone and welcome to day one of our 30 day biology study challenge. Whether you're here for test prep, review, a cram session, or you just want to learn some more biology, I'm glad you're here and I promise if you stick around, it'll be worth your time. Today we're going to be focusing on biochemistry basics. In this video, we'll do a quick review of important concepts, then answer some practice questions, and I'll provide you with some active studying techniques along the way that'll help really lock that knowledge into your brain. Let's go. Let's take a quick look at the periodic table. You're not going to use this too much in biology, but it is a useful resource to identify different elements and their chemical properties based on their atomic number, electron configuration. Each element has a symbol that is universal, so N is always nitrogen, no matter what language you're speaking. Atoms are the fundamental building blocks of matter. In their nucleus, they have protons, which are positive, neutrons, which are neutral, and then electrons, which orbit the nucleus. Protons and neutrons make up the atomic mass. Electrons have virtually no mass, but they they contribute to an element's chemical properties and resulting bonds. These six elements are really important in biology. They're going to come up again and again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. We'll come back to carbon a lot. In day three, we're going to talk about biological macromolecules, and we'll see how carbon, actually carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen appear in all four main categories, but we'll be talking about carbon specifically and how it can bond to up to four different atoms. Chinops is an easy way to remember those main elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. But just saying that silly word will help you remember these if you forget. But there's other elements as well that'll come up in biology. Sodium and potassium, for example, have really important roles in things like nerve sig signaling, biological processes. Let's go back to our atoms really quick. So remember that protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, and then electrons have different shells which they occupy surrounding the nucleus, and each shell can have a certain number of electrons within it. So this is carbon, and carbon has a full first shell here, but its second shell is incomplete, and so that means it can form up to four covalent bonds with other atoms. Really quick before we talk about bonds, isotopes are different versions of different elements. So carbon-12 might be the common one that we just saw, but carbon-14 is going to have a different number of neutrons. So these are different versions of elements with different neutrons in them, and that's going to influence the atomic mass. So the atomic mass will change in a different isotope. Some isotopes are radioactive, like carbon-14. They're going to decay over time, and we can use the half-life of these elements to determine the age of things, like fossils. Like We can use carbon-14 dating to determine the age of this mammoth here. So chemical bonds are formed in different ways, either through the sharing or transfer of electrons between atoms. The two main types are covalent bonds and ionic bonds, shown here. Uh, so this is the structural diagram of methane here, with the carbon in the center, forming four covalent bonds bonds with hydrogen around it, and then ionic bonds involve the transfer of electrons and really are based on electrical attraction. And remember ions, like we saw here in sodium and potassium, these are atoms that have gained or lost, in this case, lost electrons, resulting in a positive charge, this is, these are cations here, or a negative charge for anions. Now, certain molecules or groups of atoms that are bonded together can have different properties, like their polarity. So some can be polar, which sometimes are called unbalanced or have an unbalanced charge, and then nonpolar, which have more of a symmetrical balance to them, a symmetrical charge. And this just means that the electrons in those atoms are drawn to one nucleus more than another. And so with water, with our large oxygen and then two small hydrogens, we have an imbalanced charge, so we have a more negative side and then more positive side of this molecule. And so water is a polar molecule, and it plays a really important role in biological systems due to its unique properties, which we'll cover tomorrow in day two. Now, hydrogen bonds are really unique types of connections between molecules, and they're relatively weak compared to ionic and covalent bonds, but they're crucial for maintaining the structure of certain molecules like DNA. So in between all of our bases in DNA, we have different numbers of hydrogen hydrogen bonds. And then, of course, water can connect other water molecules through hydrogen bonds as well. Um, but they are weaker in comparison to ionic and covalent bonds because they involve just partial charges. But they are really crucial in lots of different biological molecules, DNA here, the structure of different proteins which we'll see later on. So pH really quick, another chemistry concept that's important in biology is a measure of how acidic or basic something is. Acids have a pH that range from zero to six. 
bases have a pH that range from 8 to 14, and substances with a neutral pH are right at 7. So that's like pure water, blood, but just remember that lower values on the scale are going to be more acidic, higher values are going to be more basic. Buffers sometimes get involved, and they're used to maintain homeostasis, which is the internal balance of an organism. The pH is going to come up again and again, even when we get to ecology and we talk about how an excess of carbon dioxide can increase acidity of the oceans because carbon dioxide in solution is going to then become carbonic acid, which brings our acidity up and has lots of different effects on an ocean environment. And real quick refresher on chemical equations. This isn't a perfectly a perfect chemical equation. It's the summary of reactions in photosynthesis. And so we've included sunlight here, but on one side we have our reactants, and then this arrow means yields or produces. And then on the other side here, we have our products. So reactants, yields, and then product. Now a very specific type of chemical reaction are oxidation reduction reactions and also called redox reactions. And they're really at the center of many important core biological processes like cellular respiration, photosynthesis, different metabolic pathways. A lot of students get this confused and it's a tricky topic even in chemistry. Um, so one mnemonic or way to remember it is Leo Ger and the letters stand for loss of electrons is oxidation and Ger gain of electrons is reduction. Some people think that's silly. You can also say oil rig, oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. And then in our equations, we see that that oxidation after after the chemical reaction happens, substance A will lose electron and become increasingly positive. Substance B will gain electrons and become increasingly negative because the more electrons we have, the more negative charge a particular substance will have. All right, so remember, chemistry and biology are not totally separate. Chemistry plays a pivotal role in biology, and we'll see some of these concepts come up again and again. But let's try some practice problems based on our knowledge of biochemistry. And remember, these are meant as review. Practice questions are an essential strategy for your study and learning process. So even if you feel like they're too easy or too hard, they can be beneficial and have a positive influence on your studying and learning. By having just to recall information, you're reinforcing it in your brain. If you get something right, that's a positive reinforcement and hopefully you'll remember it even better later down the road. If you get something wrong, your brain can do something which is called the hypercorrection effect, which will flag information in your brain that you got wrong and helps you remember it better in the future. And of course, practice questions can help you think critically and apply things in different scenarios. So phew, I can feel those sodium and potassium pumps working at my neurons. Let's get these questions rolling. So what I'm gonna do is just go through these questions. If you wanna pause and jump forward, you can. I'm gonna give you a moment to pause and think about the answer yourself and then reveal the answer and explain it. If you would like to just mute me and look at these questions or pause and go through them on your own, feel free to do so. A researcher is studying a new organism and discovers that it has a unique isotope, carbon-15, which is not commonly found in living organisms. What potential impact might this have on the organism? A, it may affect the organism's ability to form covalent bonds with other atoms. B, it may alter the organism's biologic processes due to the different atomic structure. C, it will have no significant impact on the organism. Or D, it, will make, it may make the organism more resistant to environmental changes. Go ahead and pause if you want. Correct answer is B, it may alter the organism's biological processes. So if it has the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons, which is what an isotope is, it could be radioactive or the stability of the actual element could be a little different, but that could lead to alterations in different enzymatic, metabolic processes in the organism. Other biological molecules may interact differently with the isotope. So we just have to see. What is true about hydrogen bonds and their role in the structure and function of biomolecules? A, they provide the primary force for covalent bond formation. B, they create a strong permanent connection between atoms and molecules. C, they allow for temporary and reversible interactions between molecules. Or D, they provide a stronger connection between atoms than ionic bonds. Think about your answer. And correct answer is C, they allow for temporary and reversible interactions between molecules. DNA, for example, has to unzip in order to replicate or undergo protein synthesis. And so those hydrogen bonds, which can come apart and then back together again, are really useful to be at the center of that molecule. All right, sulfur has an atomic number of 16 and an atomic mass of 32. This means that there are neutrons in the atom. 16, 32, 17, or 6. All right, correct answer is... 16. To find the number of neutrons, we have our atomic mass, we subtract the atomic number, and we get the number of neutrons here. Now, this is the same as the atomic number in this case, but if we had an isotope, this may not be the same, and as a result, the mass would be different. 
All right, one more for today. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor in a series of reactions of cellular respiration. What does this mean about oxygen? A, it is oxidized. B, it is reduced. C, it remains in its elemental form. Or D, it is neutralized. Think about it. And right answer is B, it is reduced. So in cellular respiration, oxygen serves as the final electron acceptor. This means that it takes electrons and becomes reduced. Remember, Leo Gur, loss of electrons is oxidation, gain of electrons is reduction, or oil rig, or whichever way you want to remember it. Thanks so much for taking your time to study with me today. I hope this has been a valuable study session. Be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for day two and the rest of the 30-day study challenge for biology. Thanks so much for watching. Give this video a like if it's been helpful, and I'll see you later.